Okay, so allow me to introduce the Youth Resilience Research Unit team to you. I am Dr. Caitlin Aspinall, the Research Program Manager. You'll hear from uh, Dr. Francois Vernon Lagrenberg, our Global Health Research Fellow in a bit. But the first speaker today is Professor Jennifer Lau, who was appointed as co-director of the Youth Resilience Research Unit in July. Previously, she studied how genetic and environmental factors interact to influence adolescent anxiety and mood problems, uh, emotional processing and youth anxiety and depression, and cognitive precursors of fear and avoidance in adolescents with chronic pain. She's also created a program of research developing early cognitive science-based interventions for mood and anxiety problems, working with schools and other community groups such as arts organizations and social action groups worldwide. Our second speaker is Professor Dennis Ugrin, who was appointed co-director of the unit in September. He is a consultant child and adolescent psychiatrist who leads a program of global mental health studies aimed at developing community mental health services in Ukraine and other low and middle income countries. He's also the author of Therapeutic Assessment, a novel model of assessment for young people with self-harm, and has developed and tested an intensive community care service model for young people with severe psychiatric disorders called Supported Discharge Service. Uh, Professor Ugrin's research has informed treatment choices in young people with many kinds of emotional disorders. And with that, I will let you get started, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to echo Caitlin's welcome to all of you to um, hopefully what will be the first of many workshops where we can get together and talk about um, the science, but also practice um, in terms of young people's mental health. So what um, we hope uh, to do today um, is to really give you a brief primer or overview of the science of anxiety and depression. So what are they? Um, why is youth a period in which these conditions often emerge? And which young people are more vulnerable to experiencing these conditions? So I will be starting with that section. I will then pass the torch on, as it were, to my colleague, uh, Dennis Ugrin, who, as Caitlin says, is an experienced child and adolescent psychiatrist, and he will talk about some of the evidence-based interventions for these debilitating conditions. And then finally, we'll end with um, telling you a little bit about the program of research in our unit, and in particular, how we might begin to work together with some of you to build collaborative partnerships to kind of tackle some of these problems together. So anxiety and depression. Um, so perhaps many of you are familiar um, with these terms and these definitions, but really these are umbrella um, terms for a series of conditions that are all characterized by mood disturbances. So anxiety um, is characterized by a number of conditions, um, by fear and worry, and sometimes these fears and worries occur to specific objects like spiders. They might occur to specific situations like social situations where you might be evaluated or humiliated um, in front of your peers or they might occur to more general events and activities in daily life. Um, then we have depression. So depression is characterized by low mood, uh, persistently low mood, um, and in young people in particular, it can manifest through irritability and anger. There's also an absence of positive mood, something that we call anhedonia, a loss of pleasure or enjoyment of things that we previously would have enjoyed. So both of these conditions aren't just characterized by these emotional symptoms, by their mood disturbances. There are also secondary impacts on thinking, cognition, and they can also manifest physically as well. So in terms of cognition, they can shape the content of our thoughts. So they can make us, um, uh, they can make you sort of um, uh, have a style of thinking that is characterized by repetitive negative thinking about something in the future, for example, like a worry, or something in the past. So for example, rumination. And they can cloud a kind of more um, negative outlook on life, on the self, and um, on, in the world and the future. 
They can also have more general impacts on thinking, so affecting decision making, affecting concentration. And then there are also these physical symptoms too. So with anxiety, um, these, these um, symptoms can manifest um, uh, through, uh, through arousal. Um, so heart beating faster, um, sweating, feeling like you can't breathe. Um, or in the case of depression, they can affect energy levels, appetite, sleep, those kinds of things. Now, it's important to stress at this point that these are normal emotions, so we all experience them to some degree. But for some, a minority of people, they can become uh, more um, upsetting, distressing, uncomfortable. They can also be persistent, so they last for longer. And if untreated, without intervention, they can have negative effects um, on, on a range of functions um, in life. So what are the scale and impact of these problems? So they are among the most common of mental health um, problems. Um, so MIND estimates that one in six people report experiencing anxiety and depression in any given week in England. They're also recurrent and they're highly co-occurring as well. So recurrent means that if you have one episode, you're more likely to develop an episode later on. Um, the fact that they're co-occurring means that if you have one type of symptom, you're more likely to have another. So a lot of young people, for example, have both anxiety and symptoms of low mood or irritability, as in depression. They're more likely to affect females than males. And there are a range of costs, so there are personal costs. So I talked about before that they were disabling, so they can affect social relationships, um, including family dynamics. They can affect school attainments, work opportunities, and also impact on other long-term mental health problems, so substance abuse, suicide, self-harm, and physical health problems too both directly and indirectly by shaping unhealthy um, lifestyle patterns. And of course, they can affect quality of life because of all those effects. Um, and those personal costs can translate into um, economic and uh, social costs as well. Um, so a lot of the costs are associated with the direct costs of treatment, but then there are also lots of indirect costs too, because of, um, of uh, sort of loss of productivity at work, people taking sick leave, those kinds of indirect costs. Now, importantly, um, for all of us um, in this uh, virtual room, as it were, um, the, 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 the age of onset, so when they begin, is often in early life before adulthood. So with anxiety disorders, these emerge across childhood and early adolescence with something like social anxiety, um, the kind of median age of onset being around 11, um, and depressive disorders emerging a little bit later from mid to late adolescence and early adulthood. So why are these periods of childhood and adolescence um, such hot spots for the emergence of these problems? Well, they involve a lot of social transitions. So as children grow up, they spend less time with family members and more time hanging out with their friends. They spend more time at school and therefore are exposed more to um, to, to, to their peers, to their same aged um, peers. Um, and this can bring with it benefits. So peer relationships are more um, positive and more rewarding, but at the same time, because um, the kind of approval from peers becomes so salient and so important, the, the negative um, peer relationships, so exclusion, bullying, rejection, those things are also experienced more keenly and intensely as well. And there are also a whole range of non-social um, kind of pressures as well. So um, perhaps the most obvious example of that um, are um, uh, sort of schoolwork and exam pressures. And in the kind of backdrop of all of that is this kind of increasing um, kind of expectation um, uh, that young people begin to become more responsible for themselves and their future, they're more independent, they become a member of society, 
And again, the most obvious example of that um, is at some stage, they need to think about jobs and becoming financially independent. Now, you might say, to me, okay, so um, why that sort of solution? Wait for, I don't know, Caitlin, could you meet? Thank you. Um, so life is full of transitions. So why, um, why childhood and adolescence? You might say, um, you know, uh, so for example, for me, um, I had um, my first child seven years ago, and that was a big adjustment. Um, no Saturday morning lions, no nights out. It was a big transition. But what's different, I think, is that as adults, a lot of us have at our fingertips strategies and regulation um, uh, sort of abilities to kind of help manage um, our emotional um, our emotions and any kind of symptoms we might have of anxiety and depression. Whereas in contrast, um, across childhood into the transition of adolescence and into early adulthood, that is a period of quite slow maturation of brain circuits, particularly those that are involved in managing emotions. So what's interesting here from developmental cognitive neuroscience data is that some regions such as the amygdala that are responsible for, um, for responding to stress and, and, and negative emotion, negative and positive emotions, these kinds of structures are um, structurally and functionally mature and they mature sooner than regions such as um, these kind of uh, prefrontal regions of the brain which are involved in um, regulating the emotions. So you have this situation in youth where you have these emotional responses, but you are still learning and consolidating the most effective strategies for managing some of those emotions. So what we think, what we hypothesize is that these social, biological and psychological transitions that are occurring together might bring out vulnerabilities in some young people. So I'm not saying that all young people um, will become clinically anxious and depressed, but what I'm saying is that if you're already vulnerable, some of these changes might tip that balance. So what are some of these factors that make young people more, make some young people more vulnerable? So very, very briefly, um, we know that the environment plays a role. So often anxiety and depression are preceded by stress. Some of these stresses can be social. So for example, bullying or negative relationships with parents. And they can have happened a long time in the past. So um, childhood events, early life traumas, or they can be stresses that are ongoing. So um, low socioeconomic status um, uh, sort of poverty, social marginalization. And there are also a range of biological factors too. So we know that anxiety and depression run in families. We know that, um, that, that this family resemblance is due to shared genes and that lot, we think that lots and lots of genes all contributing a little bit are important. We know from the fact that um, antidepressants seem to work, at least for some people, that perhaps um, there is um, uh, some differences um, in, in the role of, of brain chemicals such as serotonin in, in anxiety and depression. And we also know um, that um, there are heightened responses in the amygdala, but poorer kind of prefrontal cortex control, the two structures that I talked about earlier, in anxiety and depression. And finally, perhaps relevantly for, for the next part of the talk, um, is that we know that there are some thinking styles that are linked with anxiety and depression. So a tendency and anxiety to focus on threatening information in your environment so that your attention is captured by threat, a tendency to jump to negative conclusions in both anxiety and depression so that you leave a situation feeling more negative than you would positive, and also a tendency to remember negative events and to forget about positive events. So I think on that note, um, I will pass over um, to my colleague, Dennis, to tell you a little bit um, about uh, the interventions that are recommended for youth anxiety and depression. 
and share. I hope you can see my screen now. I'll just start in one second. Uh, Jennifer, could you tell me if you can see my screen and hear me? Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. All right. Look, so um, <clears throat> what I wanted to, to do is I wanted to take you from London, where we are now, uh, all the way to Tanzania, to North Tanzania. Uh, for and this is where we'll start my section of the talk look here we've got people called Hadza people and i studied them in some detail over uh, uh, the last few months and what i wanted to ask you to do to invite you to do is just to uh, think a little bit about the kinds of um, psychoeducation that you do with young people i'm sure most of you have talked to the young people and said, look, um, you know, we have these amazing bodies, wonderful bodies with these things inside them called the nervous system. And way back, way back years ago, before the agricultural revolution 10,000 years ago, when we were living in rainforests and savannas, if you could hear something behind you, you need to look back and see what it actually is. And you have three choices. You either run away from this, or else you'll be taken home for dinner. You attack it and want to take it home for dinner, or you pretend to be dead, so you freeze. So I'm sure most of you have uh, spoken about this flight, flight, or freeze response, right? And that is true. And then we say to young people, look, um, we don't, we no longer live in rainforests or savannas. We live in um, Hackney and Newham and uh, East London. There are no saber-toothed uh, cats, also known as tigers around, and uh, really uh, your teacher, Mrs. Smith, doesn't look like uh, a leopard uh, most of the time, right? Uh, yet, you know, our bodies are wired or designed for these responses, and that's how we get anxiety. Now, all of that stuff is undoubtedly true, but I wanted just to show you young people from uh, Hadza, who are playing. And what I wanted you to do is just to observe one child. <clears throat> Here, look Look at the little boy in uh, military trousers and like What's this game? What's this game now, Mirella? You see that he's very hesitant to join other children. And in fact, if you ask his mother and him, he will tell you, and she will tell you that he has actually got a lot of typical social anxiety cognitions about evaluation, negative evaluation, what will other children do? But, but watch just a few minutes later what happens to him in this group. You see, basically, children just wrapped him and made him stay in that circle and then play the wonderful games that they play. But, and he's even slightly, well, he's not, he's not jumping up and down like everybody else, but, but he certainly is taking part in this. So uh, my point here really is that it's not just about um, ancient predators and the kinds of threats that you would expect. I think social anxiety is actually really also quite old. But the key thing about this little boy is that we did not actually diagnose him with an anxiety disorder. And the reason for this, and I think uh, Jennifer mentioned um, about this, is that basically he had no dysfunction. And this is the key to the diagnosis. In psychiatry, when you think about the diagnosis, you think about symptoms, 
for a particular duration, and then this function or major distress. And he had none of this. Uh, so I want to just uh, you to remember about this, this point. We will come back to him at the end. So what is it that our guidelines in the West tell us to do with young people uh, who have anxiety and depression? For anxiety, the recommendations are often about a particular kind of psychological therapy, which most of you will know. Uh, it's CBT, which stands for Cognitive Behavior Therapy. And then, if that doesn't work or if anxiety is severe, the recommendation is to consider medication. Again, Jennifer mentioned about serotonin as an important uh, neurotransmitter there. And the sorts of medications that we would consider for anxiety are called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs. And one of them is called sertraline. It's in fact, the most well-studied medication in this field. And the reason why we know about CBT and uh, SSRIs as a uh, treatment of choice for anxiety disorders is because of this study by John Walkup and his colleagues in the States. It's a multi-million dollar study where um, several hundred, 400 plus young, children, young people with anxiety were randomly allocated to either receive placebo, i.e. basically a sugar pill, or CBT, cognitive behavior therapy alone, or medication alone, in this case sertraline, or a combination of medication plus CBT. Now, when we look at these children, after 12 weeks of treatment, we will find that these are roughly speaking the response rates. So children with placebo will improve in about 25% of cases. If you give them sertraline or CBT, response rate would be about 55 to 60%. And if you give both of them CBT plus medication, sertraline in this case, you could expect 80% response rate, which is in fact a very, very high response rate. It's um, similar to what we see, for example, for antibiotics for most infections. Now in depression, <clears throat> the recommendation is very similar. And in fact, Jennifer was talking about uh, many similarities between these two disorders, including genetic similarities. And the treatment um, recommendations from our guidelines include psychological therapy in the first case. The most widely used um, psychological therapies for depression are CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, and then IPT, something that may perhaps not all of you have heard about. It's an interpersonal psychotherapy. Um, and then followed by fluoxetine, which is one kind of SSRI, um, followed by one of the other two medications called sertraline or citalopram. The reason why fluoxetine is a slightly special case is because it seems to have a more favorable side effect profile to effect profile, and it has a longer half day, half life of about 72 hours, which means that when you stop it, especially abruptly, it doesn't give you uh, really bad uh, withdrawal symptoms like with some other medication. And again, the reason why this this recommendation exists is basically because of this study uh, called TADS. Again, in the same way, uh, kids were randomly allocated to either placebo, uh, like an inactive pill, or CBT, or a medication, and then a combination of CBT plus medication. And the res and, uh, response rate was about 35% on placebo. That's really quite a lot if you think about this. So 35% of kids improved substantially. Uh, when you did pretty much nothing, CBT gave you about a 45% uh, response, a medication 60%, and then a combination of the two CBT plus medication, about a 70% response rate. Now in depression, we know what happens um, one step further. So the children who did not respond to the first medication, if you then change the medication to a different medication from the same group, SSRI, you would expect about a 50% response rate. And if you give um, CBT on top, uh, another 10% response. Now, CBT, as I've mentioned, is basically the treatment of choice for both depression and anxiety, in most, especially in anxiety for most children. Um, most of you will know this. This is called the hot cross bun. Um, 
and uh, this is the basis of CBT. In CBT, we think that the way we think, what we feel, the way we behave, and the physiology of our body are all linked together in this way. And if you change one of these things, then the rest of them will change too. In CBT specifically, we try to target, first of all, the way the child thinks, cognition, uh, second of all, uh, behavior of the child, uh, and then also, to some extent, physiology of the child as well, hoping that emotions will then change. Now, the key component of CBT for anxiety is exposure. The way it works is this. An anxious child um, will be confronted by whatever it is that they are scared of. And Jennifer gave a few very good examples of uh, what these things might be. And when they're confronted by this scary stimulus, their anxiety will go up. You can see on the left uh, graph here, uh, anxiety going up. And then typically what happens in an anxious child, the child either avoids or runs away from it with the effect that anxiety goes down. This is called negative reinforcement of the behavior. And then what it means is that the next time the child is actually confronted by this, anxiety is going up, the child is running away, and it's going down. Uh, and really, an anxious child will live like this in these waves, ups and downs, for the rest of their life unless they're treated or unless they figure out how to target this anxiety themselves. Now, what happens in exposure is the opposite to this. So when the child is confronted by the thing they're scared of, rather than running away or avoiding it in the first place, you want the child to stay with this anxiety. You can see exposure one, the, the red line there, until anxiety goes down by itself. In the vast majority of cases, it will burn itself out within five to 10 minutes. Occasionally you have a child who could remain anxious for a bit longer than that. But uh, if you repeat this exposure several times, Usually the response is much lower every time until you have this flat line and there is no, no more exposure. If you then created a hierarchy of these different exposures, and if you took one uh, at a time, you will eventually end up with the child who is not scared or much less scared about um, uh, what it's, whatever it is they're scared of. Um, now the principle in depression is very similar, except in depression, the exposure is not to the anxiety provoking stimulus, but to nice things and skillful things, pleasurable things in life, which typically children with depression avoid and don't engage uh, and often are quite isolated and lonely. Now, what, um, so what happens at school, at, at the level of school uh, management, then um, there is an interesting difference there between what seems to be helpful in the short term, or perhaps as the first aid, versus what's, what needs to happen in the long term. Now, in the short term, I'm sure most of you um, have experience of this, we try to accommodate the child's anxiety in some ways. For example, you will all know children who spend their uh, breaks in school toilets and arrive the minute that the class <clears throat> that the class starts to avoid chit chat, right? Social interactions. You know, kids who hide behind the tallest uh, child in in the class to not not to draw your attention, and you 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 will you will know all of these behaviors really well. So, what we often do is we uh, put in place certain things to reduce anxiety. Maybe the child will benefit from a um, ten minute break card or some sort of a red, amber, and green system. Maybe they will have a safe place at, uh, at school where they can go instead of interacting with lots of uh, children. Maybe they will uh, have some extra time for exams and this kind of stuff. Now, all of these things have a place, especially if the child is overwhelmed with anxiety and can't do it any other way. But really what needs to happen in the long term the child needs to be exposed to anxiety in a very supportive and validating environment until they manage to cope with this. 
and we need to give them also skills on how to do this. Now, I will show you um, an example of exposure here uh, so that you have a better understanding how difficult this work actually is. Where do you think we're going to start? In the elevator. Yeah. How do you feel about that? What's your anxiety from zero to 10? Like 10. Okay. For Sadata, like some other agoraphobics, elevators feel like vertical tombs. She hasn't used one in years. Ready? She'll take the stairs or nothing at all. You can do it. But not today. It's okay. Just step in. As it turns out, step getting off. in is the easy part. What's your worst fear? That we'll get stuck. And then what? And we'll die in here. Okay. The therapist is steady and reassuring, but it's still 15 minutes before Sadana can even attempt to close the door. I'm thinking, like, I don't even know if I can do this. Why can't you? What's holding you back? I'm afraid. I'm so scared. It's your fear. This is hard. Under therapist Sandra Baker's guidance, Sadata experiences a full-fledged panic attack. <sighs> and I have all these anxious thoughts about what will I do when the door closes. For Sadata, simply being able to ride this elevator will become an act of terror and ultimately liberation. I'm going to take my hand off of the button and I want you to feel the anxiety. It will not hurt you. I'm taking my finger off. You're okay. You're okay. You're okay. That's just a behavior. That's, that's anxiety. <laughs> Oh my God. Okay, I'm gonna let go of you say. Finally, gonna... Sadata breaks through her worst fear. <laughs> You're doing it. This is great. You're doing it. Oh my God. Okay, now don't go out of the elevator yet. I want okay. you to just stay. Eventually, like removing the training wheels, Sadata has to do it on her own. Ready? Repeating the experience again and again breaks the back of her fear. And with each successive trip, Sadata's anxiety decreases. Exactly. Having taken her first leap of faith and found herself still mentally on solid ground, the next step was slightly easier. Back to the subway, again with therapy. So you get the point. I mean, it's, um, so whenever you work with, with a child who goes through CBT, for anxiety or depression, what they really wanted you to take away from this uh, clip is that it is actually very hard work and they need to be recognized for being exceptionally brave at um, really uh, confronting something that could be incredibly, uh, incredibly scary. All right. Um, so <clears throat> in terms of just something, uh, for you to take away, um, I'll give you three ideas. Some of you may be familiar with them that you could use really as the first aid for kids who are very, very, very anxious, perhaps experiencing a panic attack or severe anxiety. One of them is called grounding. Anxious thoughts tend to be about the past or the future. And grounding is something that you can use using your five senses to bring you back to the here and now. You can use the strategy five, four, three, two, one to focus in on five things you can see around you, four things you can hear around you, three things you can feel around you, two things you can smell around you, and one thing that you can taste around you. Um, if they can't see anything they can taste, they can taste their teeth in their mouth. <laughs> Anyway, the other one is called uh, worry time. This is a really cool one. Um, uh, just listen to this for a minute. 
One other way to reduce worry and anxiety can be to set aside what's called a worry time. So this is where you set aside 15 to 30 minutes a day in a comfortable and quiet space, not too close to bedtime, to sit down and have a think about your worries. Perhaps to focus on how they make you feel, maybe to think about some solutions to them. When worries arise outside of your worry time, it's helpful to postpone them to the worry time. It might be helpful to write them down so that you don't forget them and then focus in on the here and now in the present moment. You might find that when you come to your worry time, those worries that you wrote down feel like less of an issue. So this is a really good one. Um, the key thing here is for kids to remember to write them down when they occur. You know, the kind of kid that uh, sits in your class and says, excuse me, do I need to use a pencil or a pen for this assignment? Do I start from the beginning or do I just uh, go in the middle? Uh, is it okay if I hand over five minutes before or five minutes, you know, the kind of general worrying child? Now, uh, and, you know, typically they, they worry about, for example, having a bad mark or upsetting a teacher and so on. So if that child has a time, worry time, when they actually can worry all they can just about these things. But in the meantime, if they could just write it down and remember to worry about them later on, that's something that actually helps a lot of kids. And the final thing, uh, just about the muscle relaxation, something that... Uh, Many of you will know, but uh, it's just one example. When we one feel anxious, we tend to experience a lot of tension in our bodies. One way to reduce that tension is to deliberately tensen and then relax all of the different muscle groups in the body. You can do this by sitting comfortably or lying down. You might want to start by tensing your hands, squeezing them for 10 seconds and then relaxing them, letting them drop and feel heavy by your side. Then you can tensen your arms, for 10 seconds and then relax for 10 seconds. And you can move around the body using your body as a map that you carry with you everywhere you go. And then at the very end, once you've tensed for 10 seconds and then relax those different muscle groups, you can tense them all together at the same time for 10 seconds and then relax them all at the same time. This can be really helpful as a strategy for that, relaxing the whole body and you can do it anywhere you go. It can even be a really helpful strategy for helping you to fall asleep at night. You can all try it uh, at home later on if you want. It's, it really it does relax most people. Right, let's just listen from some young people about their experience of anxiety and depression. My anxiety makes me shake inside. My heart pounds. I can't focus on anything. I feel out of control. Overwhelmed. Isolated. Some thoughts come back again. And again. And again. And I, I can't, can't make them stop. stop. I feel anxious when I have something coming up. Things that tend to make it worse, probably the biggest one is social media. Work and deadlines, like, is it good enough? Will I get it in on time? I don't know if I can do this. It's facing it, you know, and, and sort of staring it down and, and not shying away from it. There's no need to feel ashamed. There are ways to make it feel more manageable and less overwhelming. Breathing in three times really deep and then you look around the room and you name the five things you can see. Oh, really helps me get out of my own head. Making sure I'm on top of my fitness because it makes me feel a lot more comfortable in my own body. Put down my phone, go on a nice walk out in nature and just absorb all the positivity in life. I find that writing down my worries helps me with my anxieties. When I feel anxious, I put on my favorite song and dance in my room like no one's watching. It's a process that takes a while, but at the end of each day, I feel so proud of myself because it reminds me how incredibly strong I am and how incredibly strong anyone with anxiety is. My anxiety. Do the opposite of what you were doing when you started to feel sad. It's difficult to directly change our emotions, but we can change the way we behave and indirectly influence them. Sadness can cause us to distance ourselves from the relationships and activities that bring us joy. Which in turn makes us feel even more sad. To stop ourselves from being sucked into this downward spiral completely, we can make a conscious effort to do the things we like to do. First, write down a list of activities that are meaningful to you. 
noting how rewarding they are, or used to be, and how easy they are to do now. Second, you can schedule these activities in your diary to make sure that you have time for them. Third, try to follow through with them, even if you don't feel like it. Commit to spending just a few minutes at a time doing your fun activity at first, if it feels too overwhelming. Finally, note down how you felt before and after the activity to learn which activities you enjoy the most and want to continue. Which are yours? Immersing yourself in art. Starting a new hobby. Going for a walk. Talking with friends or family. Do the opposite. This is the last one from our Sadness. Young. It just makes me feel like I'm alone. Empty. Hopeless. I lose all my energy. I feel blank. Stuck. Weighed down. Like a heavy rock that I can't get off my back. I could literally just think about a time like a year ago that I did something wrong and just keep thinking about it. Not looking like people do on social media. When you're passionate about something and it just doesn't pay off the way you wanted it to. And all of it can sort of just tumble and have a snowball effect. Absolutely everybody feels sad sometimes and there's lots you can do to get back up. I can find it really difficult to reach out to people. Something I've started to do is to send emojis to friends, gifts, silly animal videos, until I feel able to meet up face to face. When I'm feeling down, I often can't be bothered to start drawing. I know that if I pick up a pen and scribble it all down as a sketch, it feels so good to be able to remember what I'm capable of creating. What helps me is making healthy meals, giving lettuce, aubergine, tomato, anything, and I'll make a salad out of it. Good energy the next day. Do something kind, even if it's just making a cup of tea for someone else. When I am sad and there's a bunch of negative thoughts keeping my head stuck in the past, sitting down to meditate is massive for me. The breathing gives me some distance from those thoughts, gets me into here and now. Um, and really, finally, just wanted you to, to take you back to our boy in um, Tanzania, in Hadzaland. Uh, you know, if it's full moon tonight in Tanzania, these kids will play until they are tired. And uh, let's look at him. Kid, can you spot him? He's there playing tug of war with other kids. There, there. You can you see him? He's re there you go. He's really properly included now. So yeah, if you feel tired or sad later on today, just cast your mind back to these kids in uh, Tanzania who are having a wonderful time. And this little boy is actually included and playing with everybody else. So basically, I just wanted to thank all of the young people who take, took part in these videos and our colleagues from the Institute of Psychiatry put, putting them together. My clinical teams, research teams, students, and my scouts all say hello. And with that, um, there are some further resources for you to access later on. And um, that's it. Right, so um, before we move on to Q&A, I just wanted to end uh, by telling, oops, sorry, uh, sort of briefly ending on that sort of more positive point that although we um, started off by talking about youth as this period of risk, of vulnerability, of anxiety and depression starting, but also kind of flipping this around to thinking that actually this is a period of opportunity as well, that it is a period of heightened learning and flexibility, in particular, learning amongst friends, amongst their peers. Um, and there's lots of research to demonstrate this too. So 
thinking um, about sort of uh, some of these these questions, I, I think what our unit is really interested in is not just thinking about who becomes depressed or who is anxious, but reversing this question around to thinking about what is it that makes young people flourish against the odds? What is it that make young people bounce back from any emotional difficulties they might be experiencing? So what is it that makes young people resilient? And we don't have all the answers, but we think that you might have some of the answers as well, and that between us, we can kind of work this out. Um, so um, we, th there's a kind of um, sort of brief, a few questions that we wanted to kind of pick on your brains now. Um, and I will let um, my colleague Francois sort of um, explain to you what it is uh, we were hoping that you could help us out with. Great, thanks, thanks, Jennifer. Um, as Jennifer said, we wanted to take advantage of the expertise and the shared experience in the group of attendees at the workshop today. In the chat, Caitlin will post a link to a Google Jamboard, which I'm showing you here. Um, and you can use that link at any time. So if you um, uh, bookmark this page, you'll be able to go back and um, add notes to it. So in the Jamboard, you'll see on the left-hand side, there's the opportunity to add a note. And you can add a sticky note of any color that you like to the Jamboard. Once you've added that note, um, you'll be able to take your note and move it around. So you can place it um, uh, uh, more carefully or move them apart so that you can see the other notes underneath. Um, you'll see that we have each page. There are four pages and each page has a different question on it that we'd like you to put information on um, into that Jamboard. And you can go through the pages of the Jamboard at the top. So you'll move through from page to page. Um, and at the moment I've gone the wrong direction. So if you can move back, you'll see um, there are four pages with questions. They're the pages with hatched paper. Um, the final question is just about which topics we'd like to, uh, you'd like to have us cover in future sessions. So we would like you very much to contribute back to us um, on what topics you would like us to um, cover to ensure we cover things that are relevant and interesting to everyone. Please, uh, this Jamboard is open now for contributions and we'll keep it open throughout the week. You don't need to be um, logged into Google in order to post on, on the Jamboard, so um, all contributions are anonymous. And we thank you very much for your participation today and also your contribution um, and help in shaping our understanding of resilience in adolescents and also help to direct our research in the unit going forward. And with that, I'll hand back to Caitlin for the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Francois. When I send the link to all registered attendees for the recorded event, I'll also send a link to the Jamboard in case you lose it and would like to contribute. So if you have a question, please pop it into the chat and I'll try to group them and read them out. Uh, quickly, Dennis, there's one that's not really grouped with anything. Are there links to the uh, videos that you showed available somewhere? Uh, yes, so my presentation will be available to whoever wants it. Um, uh, Caitlin, how are we going to do this? Do people need to email you or can you email it to everybody? Uh, the video the presentation, link. yeah. The presentation. Uh, yeah, I can with email, I can email the, the presentation to, to everyone if you give that to me, Dennis. I will. Great, thank you. Uh, so we had a couple of questions around CBT, some comments that waiting lists are far too long uh, and that there are certain kinds of mental health support teams for schools uh, to combat this. But a specific question is, do you know if the CBT apps that are advertised all over the place, for example, on Instagram are effective and are they HIPAA approved? Shall I answer this? Look, <clears throat> so there are lots of apps and there is computerized CBT. Now, I can't advertise anything specifically, I don't think here, and I have to always say that other products are available. But um, there are there is a great number of these apps and computerized programs, huge number. Now, the, the issue is that um, you... Um, the, the, the issue with all of these programs is that you, you need to know <clears throat> that A, they do what they're supposed to be doing, 
Two, that kids actually use them and don't just use one session and then forget about them. <clears throat> and three, <clears throat> that there is somebody who can actually be with them. I think um, at the moment I have not come across a program that would be sufficient on its own for the kinds of anxiety and depression I work with without any consultation with a, um, with a uh, um, professional of some kind. Now, there are several who are, that nice guidance recommend. You can, you can check them out. Uh, but my point is that I would not just give this to the child and say, do it. Um, it it's something that I personally would not recommend. Um, it might have a place. Um, some of the techniques, CBT techniques, uh, it's very helpful to have them somewhere recorded. The child could actually go back and look at them. But I would not just say to the child, do it uh, and see you in 12 weeks and your, your uh, anxiety will be 80% lower. Great. Thank you, Dennis. We've had a lot of questions on anxiety. So for example, uh, how can you break exam test anxiety? Children are exposed continuously, but the anxiety and stress remains. Or conversely, uh, how to support someone with high anxiety who you've implemented all the strategies mentioned but haven't gotten any results? All right. Look, so so these, these are wonderful questions. Look, I mean, you 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 always have children uh, who will be anxious about something. Now, when you when you do a full program of work with the child, you, know, you start with psychoeducation, you then move into engaging the system. Remember that anxiety is something that is that is not about the child itself, himself or herself. It's also about the system around the child. So when we work with the young person, it's not that the young person themselves just alone need to change. Everybody around needs to change. You will all know how anxiety controls everybody around the child. So you need to always engage parents, no question about that you always, almost always need to engage uh, teachers from school. Um, sometimes you also even engage peers. And I, if, if people are interested, I could tell you a bit more about that. <clears throat> it, you, do, you do this in a very judicious way and not always. But, you know, th th there will be things that all of us in this system could do. For example, a child who is scared of school, in, in your case, maybe exams, as, as you were saying, you know, yeah, I know some kids who would come to, who would not want to go to school, who would refuse to go to school, but they will come to school, for example, if their favorite teacher greets them at the entrance of the school, or if they are allowed to feed the pet that there is there, or, you know, for, for a particular reason, they, they will come. So teachers often have a, have a wonderful, important, very important part as a co-therapist for this child. Now, <clears throat> Um, however, um, as you've seen from my presentation, there are some kids who do not respond to CBT alone. Uh, about, in fact, if you just do CBT, uh, about 40% of kids will not respond within 12 weeks. It is also true. It's a minority of kids, but, but they, they, they will not respond. For these children, uh, there are two things that could be done. One is one should consider medication it's something that not all families would consider, but we certainly should at least consider that. And secondly, when um, the locally available CBT has not worked, we have specialist services who only do CBT, not the whole of child psychiatry and psychology, but just CBT for anxiety. And they have an enormous amount of expertise they're called National Specialist Services, um, and the referral to these services might, uh, might be recommended. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, we've got two specific questions regarding referrals. So first, what are your thoughts about pupils with anxiety being referred to home tutoring, the concern being they're not able to face their anxiety? And um, sort of in the same vein, any ideas for young people where anxiety is shown and restrictive and avoidant eating as they don't meet criteria for CAMS often? Two huge questions. Specifically on the tutoring front, that is a very important question. So <clears throat> basically the child who refuses to go to school, uh, 
you want to get this child to school as soon as possible. I often see a child who hasn't been to school for two years. I think this should not happen. This really should not happen. Because the longer it carries on, the more tutoring happens at home, you know, the, the more difficult it is to treat. Um, you, you, all teachers here know about this child, you know, that is on the brink of school refusal, right? Somebody who comes once in a while or who, who does all of these avoidance and safety behaviors. One really has to speak to the parents and say, look, we should not ignore this. This is important. This is something that will not go away on its own once it's started. You know, kids who've been not coming to school for, let's say, a year will not just wake up one morning and say, look, I want to go to school today. Not going to happen. So we need to in intervene really quite early with this child. That's number one. And so tutors might have a role in the short term. But you, you know more than I do that you know, a, an hour of tutoring or two hours of tutoring is not the same as a full day of school work, not at all. Number two, um, you know, the child that is staying at home and is getting the tutoring for say two hours, the key thing there is that the child should not be entertained for the rest of the day by computer games and doing nice things. The child really has to have routine as if they were at school throughout the day. So tutoring might play a particular role in the short term, but otherwise this child needs to wake up whenever they should wake up, have shower, have breakfast, have snacks and so on and lunch, but they need to be working. And tutoring may, may be just a small part of this. That's a very important uh, part of CBT, in fact, it's routine. So tutors have a role, but in the short term, in the long term, they should, you know, they they don't have a role. They they need to be phased out, and the child needs to get back to um, to schooling. I forgot the second question, Kevin. If you have the time for it, unfortunately. Uh, we're almost to time, but but yes, very quickly. If I can find it. Sorry, I've just lost my my questions. Uh, uh, about restrictive and avoidant eating, and if they since they don't meet the criteria if you have any ideas. All right, so AFID, it's, it's something that, in fact, you know, it's, it's a long, it's a huge, huge topic. Uh, very interesting, very interesting topic. In fact, uh, if you put on jam boards, like Ransoa was suggesting, maybe we should have a, a separate talk about that. But but you're right, I mean, uh, kids with AFID, um, the question is about uh, kids, you know, who have a particular anxiety around a particular kind of food. They don't have typical um, cognitions that are typical of anorexia but they, they could be anxious about a particular kind of food and or perhaps uh, unable to tolerate the texture of the food or taste. So uh, th they are much closer to anxiety than to eating disorders in that way. And the treatment, in fact, is very similar to uh, anxiety. It's much closer to anxiety disorders treatment with exposure than to um, family intervention that you use for, uh, for uh, um, anorexia. But it's a huge topic, a very interesting topic. Thank you. We are now at time. So if we weren't able to get to your questions, I'm very sorry, but I'm going to pop Dennis and Jennifer's email in the chat. Please do feel free to email them if we weren't able to get to your question. And as I said before, the recording for this will be available. It will be emailed out to everyone who registered along with slides, if I can attach those, and the link to the Jamboard. Is there anything else you wanted to mention Jennifer or Dennis before we wrap up? No? So thank you so much. I see that there are already some responses on the Jamboard um, and in particular your, your ideas about future um, sessions would be very welcome as well. So we hope to see you soon. Thank you. Likewise, thank you so much for your interest, for the great, great interest and uh, many good questions. And we hope to see you soon uh, for further um, uh, workshops of this kind and also for our further work. Uh, I think we are, we are all really aiming at the same thing. We want our kids to be resilient and do well, right? And uh, I think we should unite our efforts and um, that's the way forward. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.